You know how I like to say I'm going to make you the smartest person in the room when it comes to our Second Amendment rights? Well, I'm going to prove that thesis correct today because I'm going to show you how if you have been following the Four Boxes Diner, you would know all the different ways that this fancy-dancy professor at Stanford University who wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, all the different ways his arguments are wrong, even if you don't have a PhD, even if you don't work at Stanford, because I here at the Four Boxes Diner have helped make you the smartest person in the room. You're not going to believe these arguments made by this professor at Stanford about guns and the Supreme Court and history. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss this one. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. So today we're going to break down an op-ed that was written by a um, professor at Stanford University really attacking the United States Supreme Court for their Second Amendment jurisprudence really on the grounds that they're bad historians, which is kind of amusing. Uh, specifically, the title of his article is The Justices Are Bad Gun Historians. Well, the first, of course, thing you got to keep in mind is you don't need to be an intellectual giant to read the Constitution. Before you even get into history, let's just look at the most important part of history, the text of the Constitution itself, which reads, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Pretty clear, right? Nevertheless, let us continue on and talk about Professor Rakoff and what he has to say about why the Supreme Court is no good when it comes to the Second Amendment. And let's critique this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, no less. Let's see how we do here at the Four Boxes Diner, if we can pull it off and point out all the different flaws. Well, to begin with, if you look at his article, he starts talking off right, at the right off the top about a distressing wake of recent mass shootings, specifically the one in Maine, and he talks about mass shootings. Again, immediately, it's a logical fallacy. Anyone with a degree in philosophy and anyone in a with a degree in common, in common sense understands that that is an appeal to emotion. Appeals to emotion, as we learned from our Greek peers back in the day in the Greco-Roman times, right? The classical period. Guess what? Appeals to emotion are considered a logical fallacy. That would be a no-go. And yet we, here we have a fancy professor immediately engaging in an appeal to emotion, a logical fallacy. Right off the bat, it's not going well for the professor right off the bat. Then what you see the professor do is he starts to criticize the approach to interpreting the Second Amendment, uh, the Constitution really, is you start with the text of the Constitution, the text of the Second Amendment, and then um, if a modern day gun control law is implicated by the text of the Second Amendment, the burden shifts to the government to come forth to show that the historical record, if you will, a historical analogical record of historical laws justify the modern day gun control law. We'll get to that in a detail in just a moment. But in the begin with, let's start with what Professor Rakoff talks about. Specifically, he says that before Bruin, the courts around the country had developed a two-step test for resolving Second Amendment cases. The first, of course, is whether the activity in dispute fell outside of the original historical understanding of the right to keep arms. And if there was no clear answer to that, courts would then ask whether uh, there was some important public interest that justified the proposed regulation. And then they balanced the individual's right of self-defense against the communal interest in collective security in public places or sensitive locations. So you see, here you have a professor that's immediately trying to argue in favor of the old-fashioned two-part test, which was, as we talked about, and the Supreme Court caught on and made it clear, we talked about how you never want to do any sort of tiers of scrutiny, any sort of intermediate scrutiny, anything involving strict scrutiny, anything involving interest balancing or means-end analysis, very, very, very bad, because what it really is doing is you... It says, yes, we understand that this particular gun control law is implicated and violates the text of the Second Amendment, but then we're going to go ahead and let judges, part of the government, decide whether or not our Second Amendment rights are really worth protecting. And this balancing is not supposed to take place in the modern era by courts because the interest balancing, the weighing of the good and the bad of guns, and the right of the people to keep their arms, all that gestalt of information and the pros and the cons of all this was already dealt with in 1791. And the compromise, that wasn't much of a compromise as everyone agreed upon it, but the agreement, if you will, of the American people 
was to include the Second Amendment's right of the people to keep and bear arms. But here you have a, a, a professor that's talking about this two-step test. Now, the two-step test was all about upholding gun control laws, right? It was step one, does it violate the Second Amendment? If the answer is yes, well, then we're going to move along and we're going to allow the courts to balance away their interests. That was essentially how it worked. Now, what's interesting, of course, is he talks about the courts in the country had developed this that's not, you know, that's sort of true, but not really true. I'll tell you why. But the reality was, as we've talked about before, where in this great country do the bulk of the lawsuits involving the Second Amendment occur? Do we see more lawsuits involving the Second Amendment in, let's say, a blue state like New York, a blue state like New Jersey, a blue state like California, or do we see more gun lawsuits involving the Second Amendment against modern-day gun control laws in places like I don't know, Texas, Idaho, Montana, and whatnot. The answer obviously is that the bulk of the Second Amendment litigations in America between 2008 when Heller was decided and 2022 when Bruin was decided took place in these terrible anti-gun blue states. And again, as we've talked about it before, in the terrible anti-gun blue states, most of the judges in these states, not all of them, but most of the judges tend to have been handpicked by the blue state senators like Chuck Schumer or Krista Gildenbrand, right? These senators obviously are only going to pick and recommend lawyers that hate guns and are willing to hew to and advance the progressive agenda. So not only do you, you see back before Bruin, even today to some degree, obviously, you see most of the litigations involving the Second Amendment in these terrible anti-gun states in front of terrible anti-gun judges who were handpicked by terrible anti-gun United States senators in consultation with the President of the United States. So that's why when you look at what happened between 2008 and 2022, you see this sample set that appears like the courts, all the courts agreed with this. Well, the courts that had an opportunity to really weigh in on this coalesced around this. But again, the courts taking the lead on this were all the terrible anti-gun courts because that's where the litigations were taking place. The litigations weren't taking place in places like Mark Smith would be a judge. It was where the anti-gun judges were. And that's why this terrible two-step process became the law in so many parts of the United States. But the good news is in Nice Super versus Bruin in 2022, that was wiped off the board and says, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that after Heller. And you're certainly not allowed to do this after Bruin. We're going to make clear six ways it's funny. That's not the case. So let's carry on and see where this op-ed takes us next with the professor. So then Professor Rakoff talks about how he's upset that the judges are, the justices were not good historians. He goes on to say things like, well, you know, uh, any well-trained jurist or lawyer is capable of drawing broad or narrow analogies as the legal situation dictates. Uh, the Bruin majority uh, did no help and did not help matters by eliminating as outliers historical examples that seemed to, you know, seemed to contradict his decision. Then he goes on to say that Bruin failed to provide clear criteria for assessing the evidence or establishing standards of proof in terms of figuring out whether or not the government had met its burden of coming forth with historical analog laws. Now, this is a bunch of hooey. You see, we've talked about this before. <clears throat> the Bruin methodology is once the text is satisfied, the burden shifts to the government. The government has to come forth with historical analog laws. But that's the key, key, key language that the anti gun movement in America hates. It's not about the government gets to come forth with airy fairy history and hire some Ivy League professor to tell some story, come up with some narrative about what George Washington or Thomas Jefferson might have liked or might not have liked. No, the Supreme Court was very, very specific. And they said that in light of the clear text of the Second Amendment, the only conceivable way that the government can overcome the clear text of the unqualified command of the Second Amendment's text, the ultimate historical evidence that the Founding Fathers believe we had a right to keep marriage, by the way, is the text of the Second Amendment. But they said, look, we'll give the government a chance to come forth with historical analog laws. And that's the key word, laws. It's not about the government coming forth with some historian plucked out of some Ivy League school like Claudine Gay, the former president of Harvard, to tell stories about history. That's not what the Supreme Court's interested in. What they specifically said is, look, <clears throat> if the founding fathers really, really believed that there's some long-standing tradition of firearms regulation that can be upheld to restrict, if you will, the text of the Second Amendment, then they would have enacted laws, right? So we don't want some historian's characterization 
a la like the 1619 project or what have you. We want to know exactly what laws were on the books that were enacted either by the judges of the time or the legislators of the time or the people at the time, whatever it is. And if there are no laws on the books, going back to the founding, dealing with a particular gun-related, gun control-related issue, then that really tells us all we need to know because the silence of those lack of laws is deafening in the sense that it means that obviously the text of the Second Amendment should control, there's no laws on point, and therefore it means the founding fathers thought that any such laws would probably violate the Second Amendment, and that would be a no-go. So it's not any kind of airy-fairy history, so it doesn't mean you don't have to be a trained historian to go out and find laws on the books. In fact, the best people to go out and find old laws and apply them are lawyers and judges, because all lawyers do in courts is they go out and they find the applicable old law, the precedents on the books, and they then apply them to today's case. So the entire effort of the lawyer is going back in time, getting laws that are helpful to your client, and applying them to today's case. And of course, we know the ultimate law that's binding on all Americans, even to this day, is the Constitution itself, which is almost 250 years old. No one complains about, hey, I can't figure out the Constitution. It's 250 years old. Yeah, it's pretty clear. We literally swear an oath to it every single day if you work for the government. And of course, people pledge allegiance to the Constitution and so on and so on. So if we can be governed by a 250-year-old document, it's not that hard to see what the Founding Fathers understood that to mean. Well, guess what? It's really not that hard to find these anti-gun laws if they're on the books. In fact, keep in mind that the, that the anti-gun lobby has spent decades, literally decades, trying to find every conceivable anti-gun gun control law on the books going back to the beginning of our country. They go all the way back to like the 1300s in England. That's how extensive the research uh, with all their billionaires' resources that devoted to this. And the reality is they can't find historical analog laws to justify modern gun control laws because the reality is the founding fathers and Americans up until really the 20th century and the progressive eras of the FDR and the like loved guns, found them to be essential tools and an essential component of freedom. And everyone had guns. They were ubiquitous, obviously. And again, that's why you would not you would not expect there to be a lot of gun control laws, except to the extent, for example, after the Civil War, there was attempts to try to disarm the blacks, the freed American blacks in the South, who were the freed American slaves, because they were looking for ways to disarm them legally in the New World Order after the Civil War. Well, then you know the professor goes off the rails even more when he starts talking about the statute of Northampton. Now, the Statute of Northampton, as you know, was enacted by England in 1328 and really only was an anti-terrorism statute as interpreted by a famous case called the Sir John's Knights case, uh, which the Supreme Court talked about in the Bruin case. Now, keep in mind that 1328 is literally before the birth of William Shakespeare and was centuries before the adoption of the English Bill of Rights in 1689. But nevertheless, there was some states that brought some components of the statute of Northampton here to the United States. The Supreme Court was well aware of this. It was well briefed. And the Supreme Court basically said, look, you know, the reality is this is really a statute that says you cannot go about and terrorize the people. It had nothing to do with you could not peaceably carry guns in public. And then they talked about the Sir John's Knights case. And they said, well, we think that here's the thing. For the sake of argument, we're going to assume that this is vague and ambiguous as to what the historical record means in terms of the Sir John Knight's case. But the reality is, guess what? As they point out in a footnote, I believe it's footnote number nine in Bruin, they say to the extent there's any ambiguity in the historical record, then that simply means the tie goes to, you guessed it, the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. So unless the government can come overcome its strong, its heavy burden to show a long-standing historical tradition, the government loses, as well it should, because again, the ultimate historical fact in our favor is the Second Amendment itself in the Constitution. All these other laws and stories and blah, 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 this is fine, but nothing can overcome the text of the Constitution itself, which again is the ultimate historical proof of what our founding fathers thought about the right to bear arms. Then the professor goes on to talk about AR-15s, but again, it seems quite straightforward if you think about it, and the Supreme Court has indicated this in Heller, that if you look at the rest of the Bill of Rights, changes in technology, changes in society are all encompassed there, right? 
I mean, the First Amendment never contemplated the internet. It never com contemplated X, Facebook. It never contemplated the telephone, radio, television, and so on and so on. Nevertheless, those modern technologies are indeed protected under the First Amendment's right of free speech and the First Amendment's right to free press. So modern technology, modern campaign finance, modern campaigns, TV ads, and so on and so on. Well, guess what? These are all protected by the Constitution, even though they're modern inventions. Makes a lot of sense, right? So, so too, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that modern arms are protected arms, even if they weren't around in the 18th century. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court in Heller and Bruin said that it's borderline frivolous, and in Caetano versus Massachusetts, it's borderline frivolous to make the argument that if an arm did not exist, at the founding era, then it's not protected today because that's not how the Constitution works. So with that said, this is just another kind of argument that he tries to make to say, well, you know, no one really envisioned that improvements were, would be made in technology. Of course, this is balderdash because the founding fathers were all about improving technology. Keep in mind, Article 1 of the United States Constitution has something called the Patent and Useful Inventions Clause. So they literally wrote in the Constitution itself in Article 1 that Congress had the power to create a patent office. And what's the purpose of a patent or useful inventions office is to protect intellectual property of, you guessed it, inventors. And what do inventors do? Yes, you guessed it. They invent new technology, new things. And do any of the founding fathers, were they aware of inventors? Oh, I don't know. Thomas Jefferson was a huge inventor. Benjamin Franklin was a huge inventor, right? So obviously the Founding Fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, contemplated improvements in technology. Not that hard to figure out if you're a good historian. Then the professor makes, I think, a terrible error when it comes to history. He talks about the following. He says that even more problematic historically is the proposition sanctified in the court's ruling in Heller that the purpose of the Second Amendment was to protect an individual right of self-defense with firearms. That view would have flabbergasted Americans of the founding era. True, a handful of references in the voluminous records documenting the ratification of the Constitution do conceive of gun ownership as a right belonging to private citizens. Okay, this is not rocket science. Do you know why there was not a lot of debate about the right to keep and bear arms in the context of the ratification debates about the Constitution? Keep in mind that the original Constitution did not have a Bill of Rights. There was a fight between the Federalists that wanted the Constitution and the Anti-Federalists that were concerned that a Constitution might give too many powers to a national government, to a federal government. So the initial debate over the Constitution was not about the Bill of Rights. It was about the Constitution itself, the body, the original body of the Constitution. And because the right to keep and arms was not debated, there's no need to talk about it. Nevertheless, when they did decide we're going to add a Bill of Rights, guess what came up? Pronto, fully agreed upon, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And here's the thing. The fact that there was not a lot of debate about it really does teach us the ultimate thing, which is it was not controversial. If you think about it for a second, as the example I'd like to give, every single night, tens of millions of cats go out and come home in the morning. No big deal. You never read about it in the paper. You don't hear about it. It's not in the news. It's not reported. It's not put down in the history books. But those cats that do go out and get into trouble and have to be rescued the next morning by the firemen climbing up a tree, let's say, you read about those in the papers. So if you were to look at the historical record, you would see more articles about cats being saved by firemen than you would stories about cats that went out and came home with no big deal in the morning of tens of millions of times. So that's the same way when it comes to our right to keep and bear arms. It was so uncontroversial, there was nothing to debate or get into. There was some discussion about it, but it really was not anything that people disagreed with, so you didn't have to fight over. So that's why you're gonna get a lot more discussions about, let's say, the role of a national standing army, or the role of the House versus the Senate, or six year Senate terms, and so on. You're gonna get a lot more writing and discussions historically about those issues, because those were points of contention. People were debating those, people were fighting about that. But one thing they weren't fighting about was, you guessed it, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed, because it was a pre existing right that literally came from England, 1689's English Declaration of Rights, 
And they expanded it because back then it only applied to Protestants. In England, in the United States, they expanded it to the people, as in the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, which is a broader articulation of the right than the rights of Protestants, which was articulated in the English Declaration of Rights in 1689, which is where we grab that from as part of the rights of Englishmen. So I'll put a link to this Wall Street Journal op-ed. You can see if you come up with additional points, I'm sure you can, but I will just leave you with this. The founding fathers were enamored by Cesar Beccaria, who wrote the book on crimes and punishments, very influential in the Bill of Rights, including all the criminal justice protections we are familiar with, like the Eighth Amendment prohibitions against cruel and unusual punishments, and so on. But he was very important also for the Second Amendment because that critical passage we've talked about before, this specifically says that you would never get rid of guns because they can be misused any more than you would get rid of water because you can drown or get rid of fire because you can get burned. Cesar Beccari went on to write in that book, that passage that was written out in hand by Thomas Jefferson and the same package, passage written out by hand, John Adams, both Jefferson and Adams, and by the way, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who for a long time became political foes after the creation of the Constitution, they died on the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1826. Divine intervention? I'll let you be the judge. But the one thing that Adams and Jefferson always agreed upon was the importance of Cesar Vicario, who not only talked about the importance of water and fire and why you wouldn't ban them because they can be used for bad ends or bad things can occur because of them. He also went on to say specifically that you would never ban guns. And if you were to ban guns, it would be a terrible idea because banning arms or guns allows an unarmed man to be attacked with greater frequency and greater success than an armed man. And that, and he's the one that came up with this in the 18th century, that individuals who are willing to commit the most heinous crimes, and violate what he calls the most important laws of the code, prohibitions of the code, like laws against murder. If they're willing to ignore those laws against murder, rape, and robbery, they are most certainly going to ignore any laws that prohibit the possession of a particular kind of arm. That was not the NRA in the 21st century. That was Cesar Beccaria, literally who wrote that before the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the creation of our Constitution. So for anyone that suggests that American history is anything other than pro-self-defense when it comes to guns, never read the Bill of Rights, never read Cesar Beccaria, and, don't real, and never really understood the history of America where everyone had guns all the time, given rise to the famous question in the Heller or argument by Justice Anthony Kennedy, who asked the District of Columbia's attorney, isn't it a fact that the settlers needed guns to protect themselves against Indian attacks? criminals, wolves, bears, grizzlies, and things like that. Justice Kennedy, or argument Heller, got it. And so does the Supreme Court, and so do you and I. But unfortunately, professors out there, apparently such as Professor Jack Rakoff, don't seem to get it. Maybe they will one day. All right? All right, folks, hope you learned something here today at The Four Boxes Darn It. Make sure you subscribe, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter, or X, at Four Boxes Darn It, and we will see you again soon here at The Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.